This month actually marks five years that my wife Callie and I have been living in Dayton, Ohio, and it's gone by really fast for us. But it was nerve-wracking when we moved because we were moving away from the church that we loved and we planted. We were moving away from our friends and our family and loved ones because we were responding to God's call. And we found as we responded to God's call, God was faithful to us and supplied all our needs. But then we were reminded as well of the distance from our families, especially when we started our own family, as we have two little girls, Lily and Gabriella. But yet again, God continued to supply our needs and bring about friends and a support network and the great people of Mosaic Church that have surrounded our family and loved us and have motivated us to be a family on mission together. Last year, on a Saturday, it was before our youngest was born, our oldest, Lily, was with some friends. She stayed the night, and they decided to take her to Cracker Barrel for lunch. Now, if you love a girl who loves to eat, this is our daughter, Lily, uh, because she can eat more than some adults can. But it was interesting when she went into Cracker Barrel because Cracker Barrel has this nice little general store and they have all of this candy and this, you know, all of these little knickknacks and and stuffed animals, all these different things. And of course, she was excited about it and adults even get excited about it. I mean, it's genius really because... You know, you have to wait in line usually to be seated, so they figure you might as well spend some money. And so as she was walking at this time and going through the general store, she picked up a stuffed animal. And it wasn't just any stuffed animal. It was an oversized stuffed pig. And as she brought it over to our friends, they were a little nervous because they didn't know how to tell her no. We're not going to buy this for you. But at just the right time that she had picked it up, someone from a church came walking into Cracker Barrel and said, hey, is this Lily Picardo? And they decided to buy the stuffed pig for her. And so she came home with this stuffed pig. So this was taken last night mind you, and she's had this for a year, so the stuffed pig was about three times the size of her, and it's turned into a body pillow, and it's part of the bedtime routine that she has to have Piggy with her. Now, some of you may know this and may not, that in a toddler's crib especially, it can get kind of nasty, and I don't need to go into any details about that, but there are times where Piggy needs to be washed, Piggy needs to go through the washer and dryer, and we made a mistake of doing that and not timing it right because she went to bed one night without having Piggy. And so there was wailing and gnashing of teeth that night. And so we tried to be slick about it and give her another stuffed animal, but she wasn't having it because she wanted Piggy. Piggy became familiar to her. That became her security. That became what she had known, and she didn't want to leave what she had known for something new. She wanted what was familiar. And I think you and I are similar in that. We don't want to forsake the old, the familiar, even if it's miserable, even if it's nasty, even if it's stinky, to go after the God risk of in walking into the new. You see, I meet people every single day that they want to take that next step. They want to take that step in their faith journey. They want to take that step in their career, their education, in relationships, family, friendships, and their finances. They want to take that step, but more than not, something is holding them back. And there are times they don't even know what's holding them back. They haven't been able to identify it yet. And so instead of taking the step, they're held back and they decide not to do anything at all. And they're just frozen. And they don't take that risk. See, I don't want to live my life in regret. 
I don't want to live my life in regret, not taking a risk for God. I don't want Mosaic to be the type of church that we are complacent and we're predictable and we're stale and we're so comfortable in the four walls of a building or a movie theater in these comfortable seats, not doing anything but just playing church. I think there's more to it than that. And I believe that you, as God's people, desire to risk some more than others, to risk it all for the sake of the gospel. And if that's you this morning, I want to tell you, it's not a mistake you're here. It's not a coincidence. God has called you to be here. Welcome to Mosaic Church. My name is Pastor Oz, and I'm one of the pastors here. And together, we risk living out this vision of Mosaic where we have different languages and people from different cultures and different backgrounds coming together. It's a risk to say that we are trying to become, we're striving to become a dynamic mosaic of Jesus' followers because we can't do it on our own. It's only Jesus that can bring together all these different people. If you look around... Because we find a way to fight with people that look like us and and, and speak like us. We find a way to fight with them, let alone people that are different from us. And it's only under one banner, under one name, under the name of Jesus that we can come together. So we strive to become this dynamic mosaic of Jesus followers. And some of you want to dive in more and you want to grow more in your faith. Well, download the Mosaic app and keep up with what we're doing if you want to serve, if you want to engage in different events, or if you want to submit prayer requests, because we want to pray for you, and we want to see those praises come in, those answers to prayers as well. Today, we're continuing our series on a book called Don't Look Down, Answering the Call of Jesus to Walk on Water. It's some bald-headed guy that wrote it that wears a red shirt. Uh, We won't mention his name today, but this book is free for you. If you stop in the visitor center, but I'm told that we're out of copies today. So next week, stop by and you can get a free copy. Um, Any copies that are purchased on Amazon, by the way, all the profits we are giving back to Joshua Recovery Ministries. So we are blessed to be a blessing. And that's what God has called us to be. We've been highlighting over the past few weeks this narrative in Matthew chapter 14 of Peter walking on water. And Pastor Wayne last week talked about getting spooked and how to overcome fear. And today we are looking at verses 27 through 29. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me, Matthew chapter 14, verses 27 through 29, or open up your smartphone and your Bible app or follow along on the screen. Here we go. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be what? Don't be what? Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. See, it wasn't until after Jesus identified himself that Peter thought about coming and walking on the water. And I've heard this text preached a lot, and it usually goes something like this. Uh, Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you don't, you're going to sink, and Peter's a failure. That's how I've heard this text preached oftentimes. However, I like to not think of Peter as a failure. Peter is a success, Because he's willing to get out of the boat and walk on water and do something that only Jesus did himself. You know who the real failure is? It's those disciples that are still in the boat sucking their thumbs. (laughs) They're afraid and they're scared to do anything. You see, Peter takes that step, and many of us, we're ready to take that step. We're ready to leave that boat. But before we leave the boat, we have to identify what the boat is. So what is your boat? For some of us, it's a security blanket that we run to. It's our natural default position. So it could be a toxic relationship. It could be an addiction or a coping mechanism or a lifestyle. Whatever it may be, it's that thing we run to. 
even that thing that is detrimental to us, that thing that is negative, it's miserable, but yet we know it, and so we run to it. Sometimes it's that negative crowd that we hang out with. Those people that are just downright negative all the time, but hey, we're familiar to them and we make an excuse for them. Or maybe we just don't want to leave our group of friends or our network or even our town or, or, or maybe even our state. But there's some of you that have done that and you've moved here. Heck, there's some of you that have moved from other countries here. And I know the struggle, that is hard. My parents immigrated from Sicily and they came over uh, when my mom was in her late 30s, my dad was in his early 40s, to start over, to start new. They didn't have an education. They had about a middle school education. They had hardly any money. They didn't know the language. They didn't know what they would come into, but they decided that they wanted to better themselves and they answered God's call. It's hard to leave the familiar in order to step out into the unknown. And there's some of you that have done that. There's one of you that we're highlighting this morning who's actually serving in our kids' ministry. And he made the journey to leave Egypt in order to come to Dayton. Let's check out his story. Uh, I'm from Egypt. I've been here in the U.S. for four years. Uh, I'm headed to Wright State this fall. Uh, to get my bachelor's in computer science. We'll see if I <laughs> continue after that. I think a big thing after uh, 2011, we had uh, like a big revolution and everything is gonna change like we want for the better. And then there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, we went into like dark roads. So there has been a lot of uh, changes in my life and uh, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of uh, just like not knowing what to do. I learned about Mosaic maybe seven months before the actual uh, start, so I was involved in the uh, launch team and the meetings before, and it was really uh, different for me. Like I've never been a part of something like that, but I really love seeing people coming together and like having that uh, they want to start something new, they want to reach out to people. So it was really good to see God and knowing and know that He. Um, has a plan for my life and uh, to be around other believers that can that have prayed for me and have um, been been a lot of help when I wasn't really there like I was like just uh, at time I was confused or like I'm like okay I don't know what to do Uh, I don't know what next step to take uh, uh, how can I finish school a lot of stuff like that but um, just praying about it and having that body of Christ um, and just relying on God and uh, especially I remember after the revolution and people are like generally praying uh, and they're pouring their heart out for for the country um, so that's that has been a big thing that uh, I saw and I encountered um, and I see that here as well uh, the the prayer and the, the like wanting people wanting change real change in people's lives and um going out after people and that god would go after their hearts um so yeah i think is the biggest thing see david identified his boat and he was willing to take that step even if that meant leaving his home country the familiar in order to go into the unknown so a lot of times we view the boat is something that's negative that we run to. But what about when the boat is positive? It's comfortable, where you can just be complacent. What if it's success? What if it's uh, the house that you've always wanted you got, the car you've always wanted, you have some money in the bank, maybe you have some retirement collected, uh, maybe you know you have career advancement, you've gotten promoted, your life is good, you're secure, you've experienced and tasted success, people recognize your hard work ethic, and you keep kind of climbing the ladder. But what ends up happening oftentimes is we think that our net worth is relevant to our self-worth. And we start to think that we've done it ourselves. 
and we become self-reliant and we pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps because after all, we've worked hard for it. We've done it. We've accomplished it. And that pattern can become addictive because we think it's us. We think we've accomplished it. We think we've done it and we've tasted just a little bit and we want more. And some of us have the things that we've wanted in the past and yet still we don't feel whole. We still feel incomplete. You see, I spend my time teaching as well in the seminary at United Theological Seminary, and I get to coach pl plasters and church planters. And one of the things I fear the most for young pastors is not when they experience failure. It's when they experience success, lest they think it's themselves and not God. And that is dangerous. When we experience success, when we experience what it means uh, in the world's eyes to be promoted, to receive the accolades and all of those things, we quickly think it's us and not God. I mentioned to you earlier how difficult of a time it was to, to make the move to Dayton because we were leaving everything. And this move wasn't just about how it impacted me, but how it impacted our family as well. Because my wife and I do ministry together as a team. It's not the Raj show, but it's us together as, as a couple, as a unit. And it really affected my wife, Callie. And instead of me sharing about it this morning, she's going to share. So let's give her a warm round of applause as she comes forward. Good morning. So once upon a time, a long, long time ago, well, maybe just about five years ago, we lived in this enchanted, magical land called Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> and Lexington is about as close to the promised land as it can get for me on this continent. And so when Roz said, hey, I've got this job opportunity in Dayton, Ohio, I said, well, I'll pray about that. Other job opportunities had come up before, and so I've always just committed, okay, anytime either of us have a job opportunity or change or something, let's pray about it. I'm always willing to pray. So I prayed, and I said, dear God, I know you don't want us to move to Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want us to go, okay, uh, we'll go. But I know you don't want us to go. And so we, I, but then God said, no, I want you to go. So I laid out my case before the Lord, and I said, okay, God, no, you, you realize, you know, we, I'm doing this amazing ministry for you in Lexington. I had a job I loved where I was getting to combine my love for the Lord with my heart for generosity and finances. And I had, was in a job that just fit me so well, and I was getting to do ministry for the kingdom. So, of course, God didn't want me to leave that. Plus, we didn't have kids yet, but we were thinking about that, and my family was just 15 minutes away, and I just couldn't imagine the idea of raising kids away from their grandparents. You know, I needed that support network. And then we had just moved to a new house the year before. So clearly, this, God, you've got this wrong. Like, your timing, this just doesn't line up. But I felt like the Lord said, Callie, if you love your life, you'll lose it, and if you lose it for my sake, you'll gain it. Whew. Okay, God, <laughs> I guess we're going to Dayton, Ohio. Um, but then I had this amazing opportunity where I, was, I told my boss, and my boss said, wait, you were my succession plan. You were going to be, he was hoping that I would take over for him one day in, the, in our organization. And um, he said, but you could, you know, you could still work for us in Dayton, Ohio. And I said, this is great. At least I get to keep the job I love. You know, I'm not giving up quite everything. But then as I was praying, I felt like God was saying, no, I, I want you to step fully out of the boat. I'm calling you to leave that job you love because your identity is not in you as an employee in this work you do. Your job is in me as a child of God. And I said, but God, I'm going to this new place called Dayton, Ohio, and they're going to just see me. Well, then I'll be just Roz's wife. <laughs> and I love being Roz's wife, but... I want it to be me and be married to this amazing man I love, but also still be me. And I said, well, how do I keep who I am when I don't at least, I don't at least have a job or something apart from him? And I felt like I was saying, your identity is in me. 
Your worth is in me, and it doesn't matter what other people think of you. It matters what I think of you. You're my child. I love you. This is what I'm calling you to do. Take a step. So I said, okay, God, <laughs> let's do this. Let's do this. Um, and I really felt like God was saying this morning that he wants you to know, don't miss it. You got to be paying attention or you'll miss it. And God's calling us each onto a God-sized adventure. And if you're paying attention, it's amazing. But if you say, no, 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 my boat is comfortable. I don't want to change. This is comfortable. You'll miss it. And it might be that you'd stepped out of the boat before. And so once we step out of the boat once, we're off the hook, right? It was, it was incredible. It was a rush. But, oh, my goodness, okay, I don't know that I want to do that again. That was scary. But God keeps calling us. And sometimes it's big steps. Sometimes it's little steps. Sometimes it's, I want you to share your faith with that person. And sometimes that seems scary. Or I want you to have that tough conversation. Or I want you to tell that person, that maybe that parent that hurt you so long ago, I love you. And God is calling us to step out of the boat, sometimes in big ways, sometimes little ways. And I stepped out of the boat. My stepping out of the boat was leaving a job I loved that I was good at, my identity, and finding it in Christ alone. But that year was hard. Oh, my goodness. I kept saying, okay, God, you know, the longer I'm out of work, the harder it is to find a job. You know, gaps on resume, Lord, those don't look good. And God said, Callie, you know, I'm, I'm God, right? I said, okay, and so my mantra for that time became, God, I love you, and I trust you. I love you, and I trust you. God, I love you, and I trust you, and I just had to keep declaring it over and over again because it was true, but I just kind of needed to keep reminding myself of that, and God gave me things to do, but I kept saying, okay, God, you know, don't you have a job for me? But God kept saying, no, just trust me. Just trust me, and it was interesting because it was on June 1st, of 2014 that I took that first step out of the boat. And on June 1st, 2015, exactly a year to the day later, was when I started my job at United Theological Seminary. And now United had asked me to work for them before we even moved to Ohio. Ross was an alum, and they found out, hey, this alum has, uh, is moving here with his wife that knows fundraising. And so they said, oh, sh you should come work for us. But God said no. And so I said, okay, I'm not supposed to do it. But it was incredible just seeing in hindsight God's timing, God's hand on it. He brought me to United at the perfect time. If I'd come earlier, it wouldn't have been right. If I had been doing another job, I would have missed it because I would have been tied up in something else. But because I waited on the Lord and trusted in his timing, even when it was hard, even when I kept saying, God, are we still doing this? You know, just keep trusting him because you don't want to miss it. It's so fun to be on this God adventure. So don't miss stepping out of the boat. Today, she's uh, the Vice President for Development at United Theological Seminary, and when that position came open, she had about five to six people email it to her in one day. Within probably two hours, it was amazing, but when God makes a way, he opens a door that no person could open, and that's what God did for her, but she had to be willing to leave behind success. She was being groomed uh, to be the president of her organization, and her and, you know, people thought, you guys are out of your mind. She's out of her mind. W what are you doing? But when God calls you, God will make a way. God will provide. You see, people view Jesus the same way. I mean, you think about it. He turns water into wine. I mean, miracle upon miracle, raises the dead, feeds 5,000 of his closest friends, cast demons out of people, and he had a lot of followers. He had a lot of flower followers. And as these followers came around, they would end up leaving. And so when you look at the Gospels, especially, and you study the Gospels, Jesus spends a majority of time with the disciples. In fact, 80% of the time Jesus spends with people is with the disciples and not with the crowds or the masses. And that's who he invests in. The people that were untrained, that... Uh, you know, the world would just kind of look at as outcasts. That's who he spent his time with, and they knew that a movement was going to take place. But I, I imagine they would probably get frustrated with Jesus too. Hey, Jesus, we're supposed to have this movement. Can you not talk about this pick up your cross stuff and follow after me? 
or, or, or turn the other cheek when someone hits you or bless those that persecute. I mean, we're trying to grow here. Can you be a little bit seeker sensitive, Jesus? Uh, I mean, can you just water it down just a little bit so we can grow? You see, Jesus had to reject that temptation and even the worldly success because in the world's eyes, you know, before the resurrection, people viewed him as a one-hit wonder. Well, that was nice. You know, we experienced some, some miracles in three years. Some cool things happened. But it's what have you done for me lately? It was more for people of what they could get from Jesus than what they could give to Jesus. And I think at times we're the same way. It's what we can get from Jesus instead of our praise and glory and, and our gifts, talents, and abilities and giving those back to Jesus. So what do you do when you identify the boat? What's next? You take the step, right? You take the step. And a step is any forward progress you make in exercising your faith. Now, when you take the step, there are risks involved. But risk, a lot of times, goes against our natural inclination. I mean, naturally, some of us are not risk takers. In fact, it's ingrained in us to play it safe. So when I would leave the house and I would go to school or I'd go out with my friends, my mom would say, now, be safe. She wouldn't say, now, have a risky day, son. <laughs> no, we're ingrained. It's natural that we play it safe. And yet, this Jesus thing and this spiritual growth often involves taking risk. You see, if we take risk just for risk's sake, we call that dumb. But when you take a risk because God is calling you, we call that faith. And there's a big difference. But we have to be willing to take that initial step. And that step can be hard to take, but it could be something monumental or it could be something smaller. And so... A lot of times we ask ourselves, how do we know God is calling us? That's an often an asked question. How do we know Jesus is calling our name to do something? Well, there are three things that I believe uh, when, this, when God is calling you. The first is God will call you with an inward calling. An inward calling. And so it's, it's something ingrained in you. Maybe it's been there for years. Maybe it's a, a new desire. It's something that you think about, you dream about. It's just in you. It's like the prophet Jeremiah when he's talking about sharing God's word. He says, the word of God is like fire shut up in my bones. I can't deny it. I can't help it. I got to tell someone about it. It's fire. Or it's like what uh, the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 8.16. That God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We call that assurance. Assurance of salvation. So there's an assurance of calling as well. Paul also talks about the call of God is irrevocable. Nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can discredit it. It's God who gives it. And God who will lift you up as you humble yourself. So it's an inward calling. And the inward calling is matched up with what we call the outward calling. The outward calling is the counsel of saints. It is that wise counsel that we receive from our inner circle of people who have been on this Jesus journey a while. Not getting the advice of Oprah or Dr. Phil, not that they're bad people, but we want godly wisdom, scriptural wisdom instead of worldly wisdom. And there's a big difference. And so as we have the council of saints, we gather those people together and we go to them. We have mentors and people like that. You know, the big powerhouse prayer warrior um, in, in our household is my wife, Callie. And so God will speak to both of us. Not just one of us. We will be in unison. We will have a common goal together. We will be in unity when the Spirit speaks. Now, I'll talk to her about something that maybe is on my heart, and she'll pray through it, and then she'll say, hey, I'm not sure we're supposed to do that, and, and we discern that together. But we have to have the inward calling and the outward calling. And then the scriptural calling, of course. Does it line up with God's work or, word or does it contradict God's word? 
Does it line up with God's word or does it contradict God's word? So God may be calling you to forgive someone. Well, we know that forgiveness is scriptural. And if you're feeling that on the inside and people around you are saying, hey, it's time to let go of the bitterness, the boat of bitterness that you're in, then God's calling you to do that. But God's not calling you to divorce your spouse so you can hook up with somebody else because you have a feeling in your liver and your quiver that makes you shiver and, and saying, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go after this person and divorce my spouse because they look good, right? You might feel that inwardly, but outwardly people aren't going to confirm that and it contradicts Scripture. So all those things line up when God is calling you. So it's identifying the boat. It's taking that step. And thirdly, you don't look down. You don't look down. You keep your eyes on Jesus. See, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing in the face of fear. When we take the risk, it doesn't mean we're not afraid. But we do it in the face of fear. And every time we operate in, in godly risk, we're taking that fear and we're fueling it into faith. But if we decide not to take that risk, the fear just grows. And it grows and it grows and it overtakes us. So it's keeping your eyes on Jesus. So my question for you is... What is your boat? What step do you need to take? Today is the day. Don't put it off any longer. You've been putting it off because you're afraid of what tomorrow holds. You're afraid of the provision that maybe you're lacking right now. It may be something radical that God is calling you to take a risk on. Or it may be something smaller. Whatever it is, that step is between you and God. But make sure it's God. Inwardly, outwardly, scripturally. Test those things. God is calling some of you to take those risks. So what is it? See, I believe God has been speaking to some of you for quite some time and you haven't done anything with it. And it's time to have that courage that only God can give you. And it doesn't mean when we keep our eyes on Jesus that it isn't going to storm. No, it's going to continue to storm around us. But we have peace and we have an assurance that no matter what the storm of life is, no matter the winds, how, how hard they blow, no matter if it's tornado, whatever it is, God is with you. God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? See, God is for us, but sometimes we're against ourselves. And it's time to believe that God is for us, that God has the best intent for us, that God cares about the details of your life. He's not just some cosmic um, you know, figure that's out in the middle of nowhere and he doesn't interact with creation. No, he's ever present. It's time. Are you willing to take that next step? 